So we, so far we're up to 18 people have joined us so far, and I think that slowed down. So I think everybody might be there. Um, so <clears throat> hi everyone, um, as you know, it's, I'm Andy Reinecke. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, your microphones and your cameras are off for the session, but this is intended to be an interactive session. Uh, it becomes very dry and boring if we just listen to the presenter, uh, who today is Leanne Brown. So please engage with Leanne. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, please put them into the chat box, and then I will moderate them and I'll, I'll raise them with Leanne uh, when there seems to be an opportunity to do that. So please engage with Leanne. Uh, Sharon, you've got a question. You want to type it in the chat box? Martin, you've also got your hand up. Um, any questions, please put in the, in the chat box. Oh, they've gone away. I think we're good. <clears throat> um, Leanne, over to you. Do you want to take over and share, share your screen? Great, thank you, Andy. Yes, let me share. All good on your side? Yes, it's all visible. Okay. Right. Okay, great. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, Andy, for, for having me. So my name is Leanne Brown. I am the CEO of Chart All Business College. I have been in education and training for over 10 years. And I'm currently in the final year of my master's in digital education, which I'm doing through the University of Edinburgh. So today, we are asking the question, is classroom training a thing of the past? So COVID accelerated the world into online spaces and online learning, whether we wanted to be there or not. And now we are seeing the world emerge from behind their computer screens and their masks for that matter. And people are deciding, should we go back to the buildings that we previously inhabited? You know, and this, this is for office spaces as well as classrooms. So if face-to-face -face interventions are um, moving online, I don't know, I think it was on a time of day, sorry about that, um, then do classroom training interventions still have a place? Industry is struggling with that decision at the moment. Um, we've missed out on that for a long time. And now they're deciding, do we go back to the classroom? So. Like Andy said, I'd love this to be interactive. What are your initial thoughts? Where are you at as an organization? Do you want to go back to the classroom? Do you want to do fully online? Um, and we'll discuss some of the, the options and the pros and the cons going forward. So I'm really hoping that everybody has an opinion because it is quite topical. So chip in um, and, and share with us. So maybe let's uh, start by discussing the difference between distance learning and online learning. So we're on the same page about what we're talking about. Often these terms are used interchangeably, you know, distance, hybrid, online, blended. UNISA would be an example of a distance learning institute. It's learning by correspondence and there's very little interaction with a lecturer. So you receive your study guide and your textbooks via the post, or you download them, and you need to submit your assignments by um, the deadline given. Your exams face-to-face -face at an exam venue closest to you. Well, last time I checked, it's, it's been a while since I studied through UNISA. Um, and you submit your assignments online. So there are no scheduled lectures and if I may be so bold as to say, probably very little communication and support. Best practice online learning though is different. Students are constantly engaged. Lectures might be pre-recorded. Learners can work at their own pace and their own time when it suits them, but there are synchronous or live time sessions um, through platforms like like this, like Zoom or Microsoft Teams, where you engage with your lecturer or a student advisor. So learner management systems that are used in online programs are capable of recording the progress of the learner, 
tracking the time spent on activities, um, number of attempts that they've done, grades that they've achieved, et cetera. So a huge amount of data is available. And this data helps us with monitoring the progress and supporting at-risk learners. So, um, again, there's a, so there's a couple of comments from people, and I think they're taking to heart <laughs> your suggestion that people interact. So let me take, take you through it. Tom Richard's saying, I believe both online and face-to-face -face still have their place. Tracy Norton says, I think it depends on the type of learning program, the audience, and what would work best. My True. thinking is that both have a place depending what it is and for whom. Yes. Liesl's fun of essence saying, different contexts ask for different approaches. Unemployed learners struggle online in my experience. So that might be an interesting thing just to talk, to think about, to come back to. Um, yes. And then Karen from the Hever saying, I think we should have a multimodal systems as there are learners that fit all the types of training, online distance, RPL, self-study, virtual, and face-to-face. -face. So the kind of the picture that I'm getting is that <clears throat> I think most of us are thinking there's probably some sort of, so it can't be an either <laughs> or. It yes. must be much more nuanced. And so yes. how do we work out, <laughs> you know, how, how do we actually work out what's from that range of options? Is it, how do we best deal with it, with this particular, in the context with this particular group of people? I think that to me yes. sounds like a question most of us are thinking about. Absolutely. And I, I, I love that we're all on the same page about there might not be a one size fits all, you know, um, blended or hybrid learning is really the topical thing right now. You know, it's a combination of online learning with, with some face-to-face -face interactions. And um, someone mentioned, you know, things like RPL. So it's not just about our platforms that we're using and our mode of delivery in that sense. It's also our methodology around how we do the training. Um, so people in the workplace have the knowledge. The way we train them is very different. It's giving them the language. It's formalizing it. Whereas unemployed learners need a completely different approach. And they might have to start from mm -hmm. basics with digital before you even do hybrid models. So can I... So there's a couple more comments coming up. Great. I'm funding, glad, guys. <laughs> funding is, I was talking about unemployed learners, I suspect. Funding is a challenge in many instances where online systems are concerned. Yes. Uh, Gail Ruet, I uh, definitely agree with unemployed learners struggling with online learning. But host companies are insisting on it in our experience. We push for a blended approach, though. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and Tom Richards, again, cost of data for online learning is a challenge. Yeah. In, you know, in South Africa, those are those are massive challenges. Access is a big um, limiting factor and it is something that we have to consider. So um, government ha did have initiatives and there are a couple of providers where their particular training systems are zero rated. So Charter Business College, for example, our learning management system can be accessed if students they all they need is one megabyte of data. So they need like a minimum and then they don't use any data to access our system because it's zero rated. So there are solutions and initiatives around it, but it's not really going, it's not changing fast enough. Um, and that might be a, a whole a whole talk on itself is, you know, what we do about access. So, so in your experience, Leanne, do you have many learners who are um, sitting in the unemployed category or with very limited budgets and, and yes. how do you deal with them? Yes. So the zero rated has helped massively with our students. And I can tell you, even those that are employed um, struggle when they go home because it might be a company laptop that they have to leave behind or they might not have the greatest signal. They don't all have fiber like we do. Um, and then there's load shedding, which impacts it. So yeah, Andy, access could be one of those rabbit holes that we that we could go down um, and look at because we are comparing ourselves to first world countries that have very different infrastructure mm -hmm. and we need to close mm -hmm. gaps that they might may not have so their solutions are not our solutions um so so if i just come back to you know the, the online and some of those comments about um blended and using classroom face-to-face -face, rpl in solutions and online I do think from my point of view that humans are social creatures, that we, we have learned being online and in a pandemic and in a lockdown that we need people. And 
classroom training then, in my opinion, is not completely in the past and hybrid would be the way to go. But the classroom might look different. You know, how is this not a social interaction? You can see me, you can hear me, we can talk, we can engage. Um, well, you guys can't talk, you can only type, but we can still engage. And maybe the classroom is digital, maybe it's virtual and it's in the metaverse and you've got avatars and you've got not brick and mortar walls, but you've got digital walls, you know? So things are changing really fast. Um, information overload all of the time. But online education and training, yes, Andy. So there's a couple more comments in here. So before we, we get too further down and you let's talk about them. Yes. Um, so Tom, I think we've I've read yours up. The cost of data online for online learning is a challenge. Uh, Mariana Drea, access is definitely a challenge for many. Tracy Norton, I'd be very interested in the discussionary access and data. And Dion, let's not mention load shedding. Okay, so point. <laughs> Liesl van der Beer says, and another factor to consider, facilitating on online platforms asks for different uh, or additional skill sets for the facilitator. Extremely yes. draining without real human interaction. Yes. Top up skills, training suggested with online skills and toolkit to keep the effectiveness of creating an engaged learning environment and not to yes. move back to a monologue type of experience for learners. Yes. Do you have comments on any Absolutely. of Absolutely. Um, so I just want to, the one that jumped out to me is the, the skills needed to train in a virtual environment. So we have definitely noticed that you can't use classroom techniques in an online environment. And funny enough, Andy and I were talking before we started, and I was saying, if you are lecturing and everyone has their cameras off and there's no feedback, it's very, very difficult to engage so in a classroom, I can tell if somebody frowns and they're like, that they don't get it. So let me say it in a different way. Let me ask them what they don't understand. When people leave their cameras off, they could be doing the washing and not even listening to me, you know? So you need different skills, you need different techniques. And that's just one aspect. So Chartle has actually developed a virtual facilitator course because we understand that there are nuances to training online. And we think that those gaps need to be closed. Um, happy to do a session on, on access. Um, Andy, you are muted, but I can, yeah. Quick question on that. How popular is that online facilitator program? Do you get many people expressing interest? Yes, yes. We have had quite a few people interested. Um, in, in general, sorry, my slides have the mind of their own today. Digital is taking over. <laughs> um, so they... Um, a lot of people are interested in facilitation in general. And because we offer this online component, we're getting quite a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's another topic. So we've spoken about access, but maybe we need to go down the rabbit hole of those nuances. Because I think there are many um, traditional trainers. If I, um, I've, I've been a trainer for many years. So I sit in that yes. box. Um, it is a really different experience and trying to understand or establish what is best practice mm. for that. I think it's, we're all yes. learning. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, to get some guidance as to what is best practice, I think would be invaluable. You know, I think it's both important for the facilitator mm. who's engaged with it, as well as for the SDF who's now looking for people to do a job of a facilitator or looking for a learning provider Yes. who's going to run some sort of a blended program and you know how good are their people can they actually cope with this yes exactly mm. um I, and i think yeah there's huge value in that we we were online before COVID, so we were actually very lucky we took our laptops home and we carried on as as normal because we had been operating in that space mm. um so we had learned a lot of the lessons earlier early enough not to say that you can't you can't keep learning um but we are going off topic, so I'm going to bring us back quickly. <laughs> and there's more comments. <laughs> Just okay. Saying. Okay. Um, uh, Sharon again, definitely there also needs to be shorter training times. There are different techniques to check out that the learner is engaging. There are also limited platforms uh, to use for online or virtual learning that are cost effective. Not everybody can use or know Moodle. Okay, so that question. Yes. Dion, um, having studied online through Chartle, I have experienced both sides 
uh, of being an online learner and an online provider. As a learner, nice. it's very easy to turn your lecture on and walk away. It's also very easy to just sit in on an online tutorial and not participate. The learner needs to understand what is what being online, being an online learner is and what is required of them. Being an online learner is, a, is as different for them as it is for the facilitator. That's a good comment. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, one of, one of the other things that we have realized is that students need to be equipped in how to be an online learner. Mm -hmm. So for all of our programs, that is a value add. And before you even start the learning, you go through a how to be an online learner course, because there are nuances and there are um, concerns. And that comes back to the online training. There has to be support. You can't leave a learner to their own device. I don't believe that that's that's so what makes education that, education. It's kind of a, is this is just a short orientation thing, or what do you actually cover when you prepare people for online learning? Yeah, so I mean, some of it is is standard as educators. You know that you are, you know, you need to have study techniques. You know, have a timetable, and then other stuff relates to the actual digital access and the how mm. how you engage and things to take note of because you could go down rabbit holes on. Um, mm. on videos or on YouTube. So mm. our systems as well need to keep people focused mm. um, because we we as people like entertainment and we can go down mm. a path. Um, so Andy, you and I spoke once before about the, the micro learning and the chunking and the mm. you know YouTube videos and Instagram or TikTok have now become new ways that we learn. And that's micro learning. So mm. it's this question, you know, has training the way we know it become obsolete? Like, do we need to adapt the way in which we teach, not just classroom and online, but that hybrid and that um, that overlapping mm. and then catering for the way that our brains are working now and this overstimulation that we have in the in the world. Um, no, I just want to as a as a caveat, sorry, Andy, because okay, I am okay. actually experiencing load shedding. I think I told you when we started. It might be a, a switch over if I lose you for a second. Okay. okay cool. Okay. Um, um, more comments? Yes. Um, from Sean Fenn. There's all, there also has to be a critical review of the verbosity of learning material. The time for heavy textbooks and vast screens of information has passed. We can yes. find that all online. What yes. is the opinion on pithy material that gets to the essence and accelerates learning when underpinned by action, a la TikTok. Yes, I love that question. So this is actually what I'm. What I want to talk about here is: is it time to adapt? You know, um, online learning happens when you are scrolling through News Twenty Four, or yes, TikTok, or Instagram, and who knows what else is coming. You can watch a three-minute clip and go on and, and do something micro learning, right? Mm -hmm. But then you need to be able to implement it and practice it. So, mm -hmm. in my opinion the content and the theory is can be housed in online systems and it can be kept there. And then you need context. And that's where you need good facilitators and educators who make it relevant and um, help you apply to the workplace, solve problems, ask questions, collaborate with colleagues. And again, that classroom could be face-to-face -face physical at a desk, or it could be in the metaverse one day um, where you have your AI glasses and you walk around as whatever you want to look like as an avatar and you discuss and you're practical and you solve it. But mm -hmm. that combination, I believe, is the, is the key. And that is what is powerful. Content, so your theory, but with context and your practical component. And that that's some of the, um, the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of what to watch and a jumpstart micro learning is chunking, you know, is the that people are busy workplaces don't want to let you go and frankly employers employees sorry are nervous to take leave because they come back to so much work mm. so we want to learn in short bursts and we mm. want it to have high impact we want it to be a behavioral change so what are some things that we should be paying attention to um, now again you can you can google this there's lots of videos lots of articles seven things etd practitioners should be aware of mm. i've picked my top three for now, just to, to share with you and get the conversation going. Firstly is digital skills. So I mentioned earlier that gap, we can't compare ourselves to first world countries. 
um, we have different challenges to them. So the need for digital skills in South Africa is essential. And there is a drive, luckily, market knows that, government knows that, to upskill and reskill in the digital world. So you just, just talk about what you mean by digital skills for a moment, because I can see two things. One is how to use bits of software or hardware. The other one is the so-called digital skills of critical thinking and et cetera. What do you mean? Yes, so I definitely mean both. So Chartal has um, developed a program called Digital Citizenship, and it is so much more than navigating a computer. It is, um, it is the, the adaptability, the flexibility, and the confidence to deal with the technologies. So you might think that somebody who works on a system all day on a computer is digitally mm -hmm. literate, but then they're not necessarily. So I heard an interesting story when I was chatting with a client, and he was saying how his children are so good with their smartphones, they can do almost anything. But give them a computer with a mouse and a keyboard and they struggle. They now try and touch screens and we're not all there with our laptops yet and they can't navigate this, this mouse and double click for who. So then it's not what we would intuitively expect from digital nomads. Those are the people who've grown up with technology. And we need people to be resilient, adaptable. So can I, so they can can I challenge you on that? Yeah, please. So... We have people who are very skilled digitally anyway on their phones. Surely yes. our learning should be focused at assisting them in an area that they know rather than insisting that they use other hardware that we are comfortable with. Yes, and that is maybe old school. It's maybe not the future for us to do anything on a laptop, you know. Mm. So you're right. Mobile learning needs to be a big component and we should potentially be designing for the phone first. Um, and then, yeah, who knows what else is going to come, Andy? You know, we virtual reality is definitely here. It's not, it's not a big uptake in the South African market yet. Cost is one of the factors. But maybe our programs are going to be designed for glasses. You know, we don't know. So you, you have to be able to handle change. Sure. <laughs> Listen, there's some more comments. I just want to come back to Great. that. Um, yes. Sean's comment again, uh, relating to an earlier earlier comments around TikTok and so on. Love that content and context, content and context underpinning learning with doing. Um, then Liesl, still some work to be done in building a bridge to get these three developments to watch, uh, to watch bullets to be acknowledged by CETA QCTO for credits. And that is a real challenge, eh? So if you're doing a whole lot of informal learning, yes. how, how do you bring that into something that you can make tangible? 100%. And that is another topical thing. So this micro learning and, and accreditation, again, one of those rabbit holes that maybe we must discuss in another session. Um, but it is something that industry is talking about a lot, and I think it's needed. So if I tie it in with this bespoke learning and these pathways, who says that doing a full qualification is teaching you everything you need to know? Maybe you only need a component of it. Um, and then you know, you, you need short courses and chunks. So something that you and I spoke to earlier, um, so I think it's worth relating. So I listened to somebody talking who says that in terms of some of the things that they're looking at, it seems that some of the learners are using TikTok more than Google to search yes. for stuff to know. Yes. Um, so there's, there's a lot of profound change happening in the areas of micro learning. My sense yes. is I don't think that SAC will have any concept of where the learners, uh, our citizens are, and in terms of what they actually need and where businesses and what business actually needs. They, they haven't, their, their notion of um, um, part qualifications and skills mm. programs doesn't even touch sides with, um, with micro learning and what, what people are currently doing. There's, there's no, there's no yeah. connection. Yeah, you know, they're, they're not necessarily on the ground. I, I do feel like they're trying in, in their defense. There are um, conversations about credits being allocated to micro learning and the, the power of informal learning. Um, so there are conversations, but mm. you must remember it's like trying to turn a huge train mm. around in a driveway. It's bureaucracy and red tape, no. and um, there's so much more that has to change. Mm. 
Well, what worries me is, you know, if, if we, as a society, if we don't respond to what people want, um, they just keep on moving in their own direction. So we lose, we lose them. Absolutely. There, there, there is an educational revolution that needs to take place. There is, this is the time to be having the conversations that are far greater than just whether or not we should be online in the classroom. It's about fundamentally, what do we want to teach people now? You know, we're not operating in factories. The machines are doing that. The robots, the automation. We we want to move into the fifth industrial revolution, or even past the fourth. You know, <laughs> uh, four minutes left. Yes, I know. I mean, look, I'm I'm pretty much done. So if I'll just wrap up on the bespoke um, learning. So basically, this has been around for a while. The whole personalized learning journey, and saying if you are interested in this con this course then then do a micro learning on that and if you enjoy it go down that path and become an expert you know and this learning is ideal for online platforms because you don't have to have a facilitator in a classroom who's available to do 20 different people's um, bespoke programs that's far too difficult but online systems help us to whether it's self-led, facilitator-led, online-led, facilitate that journey. So you know, the, the, the model that sits in my head as to how that might work is I think the, the um, TikTok paradigm, how the TikTok algorithm works. The TikTok algorithm, for example, if you compare it with Facebook, Facebook, you follow people. Yes. TikTok, you follow ideas. So you're not Absolutely. following a particular person. The algorithm picks up what you spend your time looking at and sends yeah. you more of the same. And that must surely be the logic that we apply to learning. If somebody's interested in an area, yes. the algorithm should give them more of that same sort of logic. YouTube yes. I see also tries to do that. So if you watch YouTube, you'll see that suddenly, as the screen refreshes, it sends you more little videos along the same same topic. It's like Netflix, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so Andy, I mean, I could talk about algorithms. I love it because that is an interesting debate as to are the algorithms doing the right thing or that are they now influencing what it is you're going to be watching because it's deciding for you what to show you and you get caught up but that we are then in the hands of the programmers and it's become this black box in education yeah, but it's, it's not a it's not a good or bad thing on its own you know um, no it's it, it's it takes not. you down a rabbit hole and you don't like the rabbit hole you can then climb out <laughs> different stuff to adjust yeah. the algorithms stop sure. you know you have some control listen there's a couple of comments and we've got two minutes so let me get to right. them um sean finn again unesco has raised the global conversation on micro learning it's not just an rsa issue it's a good comment uh, yes. and then dion i find problem i find with tiktok in, for info is credibility anyone can push their perspectives and opinions without any consequence or credentials true same yeah. with youtube though same with wikipedia yeah, same with you can edit those pages so yeah. It's, it's actually then for learners, the ability to differentiate between what is something that they should take seriously and what is a blog or an opinion. And that's a critical thinking skill that we need people to develop. Which is, I think is something that we can do something about. Yes. Um, you know, yes. people do apply critical thinking, but if you look at <laughs> some decisions that some people make, <laughs> maybe it's not that Questionable, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly. Listen, we we on time. Hey, it's we're on ten o'clock. Leanne, thank Correct. you so. Much. It's been. I found this fascinating. Um, from the responses of people in the chat box, I think I think others have as well. So, thank yeah, you thank you much. for all the comments and questions. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank uh, the, you. Um, link for the uh, CPD points is will be there for another couple of minutes. So please get some if you need them. Some nice comments coming through from um, the group today. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. So, thank yes, you. echoed by um, the rest of us, I think, as well. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you so much, Andy. Thanks, everyone, for your time.